Uh, let's welcome Nina Landis. Hi. I had to get situated. Give me a minute. I'm usually like, I usually have like 25 beverages, but I only brought one today. Okay. Oh my goodness. It's a sweet morning. They prayed for me this morning and I said I felt like they just like shot fire in my belly. I hope that's not too charismatic for you, but that's how it felt. Um, so I just feel tender and hungry for the Lord today. And I just want to lean into his heart with you and, um, and just get to know him a little bit better. Uh, I might just cry a lot because when I talk about Jesus, I cry because I really love him. Um, so forgive me if I cry a lot. I'll try and be articulate. <laughs> I'm already crying, but that's just how it is with me. So I'm going to pray for us. Can we just stand up together? Why don't you uh, put your hand on the person to your right or your left, and we're just actually going to pray. I'm not going to pray for us. I'm going to pray with us. So let's pray for each other. We're going to ask God to give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him today. So go ahead and pray when I pray. God, I thank you for everyone that's here today. God, I thank you for the desire in their heart to know you more, to be more completely abandoned to your will. Father, I ask today by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. God, that you would wake on our hearts with your truth, that you would cause your word to run swiftly in our hearts and that you would be glorified. God, I ask that you would root the truth down in us today, that you would increase our hunger, God. I ask you for an increase of spiritual hunger today. God, I ask you for fervency in the human heart. God, I ask you for a revelation of the beauty of your son today. God, I ask that you would open our eyes and you would open our ears and that you would draw us into deeper places, deeper desire, increased hunger, deeper understanding. God, we say, here we are, your beloved one. Friends, speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh my goodness. Okay, so worship is this huge topic, right? Like, I just feel like we say it all casually, like, we're gonna talk about worship. And it's like it's it's eternal, it's completely other than. We've only like really caught this little glimpse of what it's actually going to be like. I was talking with my husband this week, and I was talking about what do you think it's like to just like really stand before his throne and see him in all of his glory? Like what do you think that's actually like? What do you think is going to happen on the inside of us? Like I think I might explode. Like, I just think, like, oh, my goodness, and you read the scriptures, and you hear the stories, right, of the encounters and Isaiah, and, and the first thing out of his mouth, right, is like, whoa. He says, whoa, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. His acquaintedness with his humanity and the separation of the holiness of God and the humanity of himself, and he just goes, whoa. And I just think like, you know, in America and in the church, we, we can um, get really familiar with God or with the language of God or with um, even the culture of church. And we can forget that he's a real God on a real throne. He's the uncreated God. He's holy. He's totally other than. He's majestic. He is wonderful and awesome. And when we behold him, it causes our frame to tremble. When we really behold him. But I have really good news for us today. <laughs> so I think sometimes it's hard for me to actually preach about worship because I'm a worship leader. And you may think that sounds weird. But what happens is everybody thinks that I have some kind of superpower because I lead worship. And they're like, oh, well, it makes sense to you because you're a worship leader, obviously. 
And so you must have been like anointed with some special anointing for beholding God. And you must have some special access to his heart. And you must have some special revelation of his word. And so it's easy for you to do what you do because you're a worship leader. And so I get a little bit rowdy about that. Because I, I am jealous for you with a holy jealousy. Because your worship, your understanding of the beauty of God, your revelation of who he is, is yours. And you're the only one that can give it to him. And you're the only one that can cultivate it. And it is not some kind of, like, reserved for the select few. I love what Dan said last week. It's not that we're called to worship. We're called to be worshipers. It is literally why we were fashioned. Not just why Nina was fashioned, but why you were fashioned. It is literally why we were made. And so I'm going to dive into that a little bit, but I just, I just want to like level the playing field right out of the gate. I'm just a girl who got plucked out of deep waters and set on a solid rock. I'm just a girl who chased so many other lovers and got chased down by perfect love. I don't have superpowers, but I am being transformed like you by wonder-working power. There is nothing different about me because I'm a worship leader. I am a worshiper, and you are worshipers. And we're going to dive into that more today. So I'm going to start in Genesis 1, and I call this the Nina paraphrase, okay? This is the Nina paraphrase. And so you can read it. Please read it. Please read your Bible. Everybody hug your Bible. Oh, the word is so good. Please read it. For real. Do you know that 8% of the church actually reads their Bible? 8%. Barna Group statistic just came out this past year. 8%. Please read your Bible. These words are true. These words are life. Okay, so Nina paraphrased Genesis 1. God created man. Okay? So there's this whole scene. We all know it. We're super familiar with it. But familiarity breeds contempt. And so I'm going to bring it to you in a new way today. And I want you to think about it differently maybe than you've ever thought about it before. Okay, so we have, we know, right, that God created man in his image, right? Okay, male and female, he created them. So we have this little whisper right out the gate. He's like, trying to show you something, pay attention, okay? Do you ever read your Bible like that? I I read my Bible like that all the time. I ask so many questions. I think Jesus really likes it. I'm always like, what does that mean? Total sidebar, but did you know That in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when Jesus was being taken away, it talks about this random guy that ran away naked. And nobody knows who he is or what it meant or why. I read that the other day and I was like, what? What is this in here for? What are you trying to tell me? Read your Bible with curiosity. Ask questions. He loves our questions. Okay, so Jesus, right out the gate, is trying to give us a little insight into his heart and how he feels and what he thinks and what his desire is. And so he creates man in his image, okay? Male and female, he creates them. And then it's naming day, right? And Adam is supposed to name all the things, right? And Eve hasn't been created yet. So you've got Adam who's created in the image of God, and it's naming day. And all the animals are passing in front of Adam. And I just sort of imagine it like, like God standing there with Adam, and he's just like, setting him up for curiosity and like a window into his heart. And so as the animals are passing in front of Adam, he's like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a male lion. That's a female lion. 
oh yeah, that's a male bear, that's a female bear, okay? And, and all the animals are passing. And I imagine that Adam starts to feel a little unsettled. He's like, something is missing, right? And he's looking at all these animals with a counterpart. And they're all passing in front of him. And he's naming them. And, and I imagine Jesus there just sort of like leaning in like, is he going to get it? Is he going to get it? And then all of a sudden, Adam's like, wait a minute. I need a helper. Everybody has a helper except for me. Alarm, alarm, alarm. Right? And, and then Jesus is like, yes. What do you think Jesus wanted Adam to get in that moment? God said, all this is good, right? But what is not good? That man would be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. This is an invitation from the Lord right out the gate of his desire and his heart and what he's feeling as the uncreated God. And he says, hey, all this is really good. And you were created in my image. But I want you to know something about me. I don't want to do it alone. I want a counterpart. I want a helper suitable for me. God wants a helper suitable for him. Guess who that is? It's us. What in the world? We get to be God's counterpart? You guys, we cannot be casual about this. This is amazing. We have the triune God, the uncreated God in perfect fellowship. And then he says, hey, let's bring them in up here with us. Let's do it together. Okay. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they would know you. The word know right there in John 17, 3 is an intimate word. It's the way Adam knew Eve. It's a joining and a union and a one flesh kind of no. Okay? So this is eternal life that they would know who? Jesus. But not just head knowledge that puffs up. Not just information that we get at Bible college. Not just Sunday morning regurgitated whatever that we get, right? But that we would know him intimately, like one, becoming one with God. This is eternal life, that we would be unified with the uncreated God in an intimate way. We see this in John 17 when Jesus prays to the Father. I talked about this this morning. This makes me cry every time because I think about this prayer that Jesus was praying in John 17. We're going to read it together because it's so good. And starting in verse 20, it says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. What? world so that the world may believe that you have sent me the glory that you've given me I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me and then listen look look at this how many people in this room know that if Jesus says, I desire, we should pay attention? Do you want to know what the uncreated God desires? What does he want? This is what he wants. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me 
before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you've sent me. And I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known. That the love, why, why? Why is God going to continue to make it known? That the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Worship is the manifestation of John 17. Worship is the desire of Christ. It is the longing of his soul. It is his deepest craving. That kind of communion and holy fellowship. We were made for communion with God. Jesus came so that we could be with him where he is. There was a separation in the garden, right? There was a separation from that communion and that fellowship and that oneness. And Jesus came to restore it, to bridge the gap, to buy us back. Not so that we could chit-chat, not so that we could puff one another up, not so that we could get all of our degrees and feel really important. He bought us back so we could be with him. Where he is. Where is he? Jesus is seated on a real throne right now at the right hand of the Father. He is in the center on a sea of glass. And he is surrounded by creatures and elders and witnesses. And guess what they're doing? Worshiping. Adoring. Lauding, beholding, discovering. They are continuing to know the Father. And Jesus came to make the Father known. Why do we need to know the Father? So that we can love properly. So that we can worship properly. Nobody graduates from the knowledge of God. We will do it for eternity. We will behold him forever and ever. And, and he's unsearchable. There's so much to behold and to know about God that we won't ever run out. Jesus highlights something in this chapter. The value or the currency of knowing his name. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The knowledge of God is not a superpower reserved for a select few. Acts 10.34 says, God shows no partiality. This goes way past intellectual concepts. This is about encounter. This is about his presence. It doesn't matter how old we get, we will need to continually know the Father. We do not arrive at this destination. I'm going to tell you a story. It's kind of intense, so I'm just warning you. But I, I really believe in being honest and transparent because we're all working out our salvation, right? And everybody has a story where they've wrestled with God. And I was um, in a prayer room. I was pastoring in the Bay Area, a, pray, a praying community, a praying church. And I was sitting in the prayer room, and we had Malachi, who's 15 now. He was playing drums with us this morning. And we had Ada, who's 13 now. She's home taking care of her little siblings because one of them wasn't feeling well. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in over my head with Ada. 
like, just to be honest. So I'm like, I don't know if we want to do more kids. I'm a little, I'm a little overwhelmed. And so I'm sitting in the prayer room and I'm seeking the Lord. And he invites me into having another baby. And I'm like, oh, gosh. I want to be obedient, but I don't know if I want to do this. And he says, you're going to bear a child, and his name will be Jedediah. And with Jedediah, I will build my house of prayer. I write it down. I'm trembling. I go home to Ryan. I'm like, babe, I don't know. What do you want to do? And he's like, whoa, that's a lot. We're pretty overwhelmed with the two that we have. And we, we decide we're going to agree with the Lord. We're going to trust him about this another baby and that he's going to give us what we need. And so I get pregnant. And um, I had two very healthy pregnancies, two very healthy babies. And um, about 10 weeks in, I start to lose this baby. Now, this is significant because a few months previous, our goddaughter, who was three years old, drowned. And we went and we prayed for resurrection for four hours. And we ultimately just had to release her to the Father. And so my heart is already in this kind of tumultuous wrestle with God. And then he invites me into this pregnancy I obey him, and now I'm losing this baby of promise. And I am ticked off. Can I say that? I'm mad. And I, I'm sitting in the prayer room and grieving and wrestling. And I lose Jedediah. And a couple months Later, we get pregnant again, and nine weeks later, I lose faith. And I'm done. I'm mad. And I'm sitting in the prayer room, and I have my journal, and I have my Bible, and I'm just ticked off. You ever just sit with those things like, ugh, I'm here, but I'm super annoyed. And I write across two pages of my journal, our you a liar. And I slam my Bible closed. And I slam my journal closed. And I go home. And I'm putting Ada to bed. She's a little over three years old. Almost four years old. And I'm getting ready to walk out of her room. And she says, Mama. Mama, Remember? And immediately when she says, Mama, remember, I feel a flood of the presence of God. You know what that feels like? And so I stop and I turn around and I said, I, I don't remember. Will you tell me? And she says, remember when Jedediah and Faith were walking to Jesus? And I said, I don't remember. Will you tell me? She said, remember, Mom, Jedediah was making fire for Jesus. Why is that significant? Because priests make fire for Jesus. She tells me that Jedediah was wearing a blue coat, which means revelation. Faith was wearing a purple coat, which means royalty. And that Jesus was with them. And I'm weeping next to my three-year-old daughter in her bed. And I tell her, thank you for telling me. Then I get up and I'm walking out of the room in the sweetest whisper from the Holy Spirit. Then he says, I'm not a liar. You did bear a child. His name is Jedediah. And I am building a very real house of prayer with him. But we see in part and we know in part. So why do I tell you that story? Because my faith journey required that I continue to know the Father. My faith journey required that in my wrestle and my ache and my lack of understanding that I lean into a continual knowing 
and understanding God in ways that I haven't known or understood him before, right? Because my understanding said, I lost that baby. You lied to me. But God said, I didn't lie. That baby is real and that baby is with me. And I'm doing something very real with that baby. Okay, we have to continue to know him. And Jesus promises that he will continue to make him known. When we search the scriptures, we see Jesus. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. Why is he continuing to make known the name of the Father? Because worshipers are born through the revelation of the Father. The definition of worship in the Webster Dictionary is to honor or reverence as a divine being or supernatural power. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. The Bible says to bow. To bow. We can't love God rightly without a revelation of God. We can't love him unless we know him. We can't worship him unless we behold him. We can't grow as worshipers in our design unless we lean in to know the one we're worshiping. And we continue to lean in and continue to lean in. Why? That the love with which the Father has loved me may, may be in us. We can't love him unless he helps us. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. This is another really familiar verse. But if we're reading it, not like at a wedding, if we're reading it coming from a God who created us to be worshipers, who gave us his son so we could know him, and who desires for us to grow in mature love as his counterpart, right, so that we could be with him where he is, then we're reading it differently now. What does love look like? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love never ends, verse 8. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Listen. Our portion as believers is not the song and dance. Our portion as believers, what all this is going to pass away. All of this. This, lights. I told Dan if we get a smoke machine, I'll probably quit. No, I'm just, listen. Like, we have turned worship into a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Worship is about love. It's about making love our highest aim. It's about knowing the way that we're known. It's about leaning in again and continually knowing God. 
listen, I've been loving Jesus and walking with him for almost 30 years. And I need to continually know him. I can't stand up here and sing songs to the ceiling. It's Christian karaoke if we do. I'm not interested in karaoke. He's not interested in karaoke. He is interested in worshipers that know him and behold him and look at him and wonder at him and get curious about him and lean into him and feast on his word like it's life to our bones because we'll die without it. We'll faint without it. And I know I'm intense, but it's because I'm jealous for you. I'm jealous for me. Hosea 6, verse 6 says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What does that mean? It means we can put on a show and he doesn't want it. He wants us to know him. He wants to be known. You want to know what worship is? Know God. Behold God. Lean into God. Discover God. This is an overflow of that. When you see me crying up here, it's because I was crying in my living room first. It's because I know that I was drowning in my own sin. And a perfect God bent down to the dust and lifted me up to sit with him. And I haven't forgotten. And I remind my soul again and again that he's worthy of my life because of who he is and what he's done. And I will continue to know him because it's what Jesus paid for. It's what Jesus came for. So that I can be with him where he is. We can't have one without the other. First Corinthians 2 9. How do we do this? It's not by might, it's not by power. I can't, Nina can't bootstrap her way into knowing God. You can't either. I don't care how many degrees you have. You cannot bootstrap your way into knowing God. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. You guys, Jesus said, it's better for you if I go. Why? Because I'm sending you a helper. Does that sound familiar? I'm sending you the helper. And the helper is the greatest search engine of all time. It searches the depths of God. Jesus came to reveal the Father so that we could love rightly. And then he gave us his spirit so we could be with him where he is forever. So it's not by your own might. 
don't let that condemnation get on you today. Like, oh man, I don't love God enough. I should spend more time in my Bible. Listen, that's not what I'm saying to you. I'm saying when you yield to the spirit of God that is at work within you, you get a revelation of the beauty of God and the depths of God and you can't help but worship. You can't help but want to be where he is. You can't help but want to sing. You can't help but want to love him and adore him. And if your heart feels dull, if it feels hard to love God right now, there is a helper for you. And we can't love him unless he helps us. We can't worship him rightly unless he helps us. Romans 11.33. I love this verse so much. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. If you leave with anything today, oh, that you would be hungry for him. Oh, that you would be curious about why I weep when I'm up here. Oh, that you would be caught up into a storyline that is your portion. Oh, the depths of the riches, of the wisdom, of the knowledge of God. It just keeps going and going and going. He will continue to make him known to you if you let him, if you lean in to him. If you invite him into those places. Charles Spurgeon. I love me a good Spurgeon quote. Worship is the highest elevation of the spirit. And the lowliest prostration of the soul. The access we have to God is transcendent. Listen, there's no other created being that has the access that you have to the depths of the riches of the wisdom of the knowledge of God. We're the only ones that he gave that kind of access to. We're the ones he was praying for in John 17. It's me and it's you. It's transcendent to behold him, to gaze upon him. To enter into what he paid for. But listen, when we get there, we fall prostrate because he's holy and he's worthy and there's nobody like him. It's why Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He is God and we are man. Eugene Peterson said, worship does not satisfy our hunger for God. It whets our appetite. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We practice, right? We start somewhere. We choose it. We lean into it. We invite the Holy Spirit. We remember what he saved us from, what he drew us out of. And then we lean in and we go, oh, I remember. I remember. And therefore, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and wealth and wisdom and riches forever and ever. And I want to join with heaven and I want to say it and I want to sing it and I want to be who you designed me to be because I'm continuing to know you. And the more I know about you, the more I want to tell you how worthy you are. And the more I behold you, the more undone my heart is by your beauty and by your goodness and by your majesty and by your worth. Listen, this is not reserved for me. This is your portion. When we position ourselves in this kind of bowing and beholding and bowing and beholding, our desire to know him grows. When we practice feasting on God, 
our appetite grows. You know, when you start eating salad, you're kind of like, I don't really like salad. I'd rather have a cheeseburger. <laughs> okay? But when you practice eating salad, it changes your taste buds. It changes your desire. And then you're like, man, I really want a salad. I just feel like my body really needs a salad. Has anybody ever experienced that? Yes? Okay. It's the same with God. It's the same. Maybe when you start practicing, you're kind of like, this feels a little clunky. This feels a little awkward. I don't have a lot of revelation on the beauty of God, on the, on the worth of God. But then the more you eat it and the more you practice it, then suddenly you're like, I need to be with God. I really need God. And all these other things that we were feeding our soul with become lesser pleasure. And then he becomes superior pleasure. It's practice. It's not mysterious. It's really practical. And we have a helper, the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Listen, Song of Solomon says it like this, I am dark, but I am lovely. We have to stay tethered to our desperate need for a savior and the incredible privilege that he invited us in to commune with him forever. It's both. You are transcendent and have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. And also, without him, you can do nothing. It's both. And we have to stay tethered to it. If we want to be worshipers who worship rightly, we stay tethered to the salvation of Christ and the privilege of being called his beloved. The privilege of being with him where he is. Okay, are you okay? I want to get practical with us now because I can preach my face off about this all day long, but if you leave and you're like, I don't know what to do, then I didn't do a good job. Because this is real. We have to work our salvation out, right? And so you can feel all inspired, but if you leave and then you don't know what to do, then we haven't done a good job, okay? So I'm going to talk real practical. So now I'm going to give you guys some points. The first one is, Dil like, how do we become worshipers? Diligence in the word. So practical. I know everybody says it, but like 8%. 8%. You guys, Jesus is called the living word. He is the word made flesh. Do you want to know Jesus? Read your Bible. For real. When it feels amazing and when it doesn't. When every word is jumping off the page and when you're like, oh, wow, Whew. here we go. It's like lifting weights. It's practice. But I promise you, if you keep eating salad, you're going to want salad. Your body's going to crave it. You're going to recognize what happens on the inside of you when you feast on the word of God. I just finished a 40-day fast, and I'm not telling you that to boast because it was weak and gnarly. And God knows and sees my heart. But listen, I, in that 40 days, went through the whole New Testament. Just ate the word like a fire hose. Just feasted on it. And, and you, you know what? I, one of the things I was praying for? That God would increase my hunger for the word. Guess what he did? In that 40 days, he increased my hunger for the word. Now, if I don't do that 
rhythm of reading the way I was reading for the last 40 days, I feel, I feel awkward. I want salad. I'm craving it. I need it. I feel malnourished without it. Okay, so practical. Read your Bible. I promise you, your appetite will grow. Okay? It's daily bread. The second one is practice abiding and beholding. John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. We talked about that. Psalm 27, 4, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Listen, that's not some like weird, mythical, reserved reality for a select group of people. This is your portion. He tore the veil from top to bottom so that you could come in close. So you could look at him, behold him, wonder at him, inquire of him, sit with him, practice, practice. And this may mean, this is not religion, listen to me. We are in this culture right now where we keep calling spiritual disciplines religious. I am telling you, we will die without them. It is not religious to desire God and to make him a priority. That is not religion. That is love. That is a, a person who recognizes that they've been saved to the uttermost. Okay? And we, we need spiritual disciplines in our lives. We are the most undisciplined people. Everything's impulsive and microwave. And God's like, will you sit with me? Will you look at me? Will you slow down a little bit? Just wait. Just wait a minute. Do you know how nervous people get if you wait in worship? It makes the whole room so nervous because we don't know how to do it. We haven't practiced. Jesus is not in a hurry. He has eternity. Let's practice. Let's practice beholding. Let's practice abiding. Let's practice looking at him. So what does this look like? It looks like maybe denying some of those lesser, lesser pleasures to make room for this in your life. Okay? Nobody likes that. Everybody's getting nervous. It means turn off Facebook for a while. Turn off Instagram for a while. Only check your emails once a day. Put your phone on do not disturb for an hour. No one is going to die. It is okay. It is okay. I promise. But it takes practice and conscious effort. And then sit with God. And then be honest in the discomfort of it. Like, wow, I've been here for five minutes and I'm really bored. And I don't know what else to say. And now if you could speak, that would be great. Okay, listen, I just want to validate this. Like, I might be 30 years deep on loving Jesus, but I am still trying to figure out how to sit with him and not be distracted. Okay? We don't grow out of it. And it takes practice, and it takes spiritual disciplines. So wait on the Lord. Give him time. Carve out time in your schedule to be with him. Abiding simply means that in all things, we're turning our hearts and remembering that he is God with us. We make ourselves aware of that person, the person of Jesus, and that there's real relationship available. Okay? So, like, I'm doing the dishes. I'm a mom. Okay? I'm cooking a meal. While I'm cooking the meal, I'm turning my heart and my attention and my inner man towards Christ. What are you feeling, God? What are you thinking? 
is there anything you want to say to me right now? Or sometimes it's just gratitude. I love you. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for the ability to cook a meal for my kids. Thank you that you're with me right now in the kitchen and that we can do this together. It's a turning of the heart, an awareness, and it takes practice, and we're not good at it at first. You can ask my kids, though, at any given moment of any day, I may burst out in conversation with God out loud. It just comes out of nowhere sometimes. But it's not out of nowhere. It's out of practice. It's out of practice of turning my heart and beholding him in the most mundane of moments, in the most practical aspects of life. He is the available God. He wants relationship with you. He's in all of it. And it can all be worship if we would just turn. All right, number three, steadfast love. Remember Hosea 6.6. 6. What does he desire? Steadfast love. Steadfast means steady. Do you know how challenging that word is? Steady or consistent. I had a mom tell me years ago, I said, give me advice as a mother. You've raised kids. What's the one thing that I should know as a mom that's really important? And she says, be consistent. And I thought, that is a weird thing to say. And then I became a mom. And I thought, oh, my word, it is so hard to be consistent. That is the most challenging instruction. Steady love is consistent love. It's consistently showing up to love God. It's consistently saying, here I am, all my weakness. I just imagine him sometimes, because this helps me, just keeping it practical. I imagine that when I do my little weak turn of like, gosh, I'm really trying to love you right now while I'm changing diapers, you know, and I do the turn, I just imagine Jesus is like, she looked at me. Did you see that? Like he just shouts to the angels. Did you see that? She looked at me. She loves me. She loves me. I saw it. Did you see it? And I know that that little turn of my heart to him, no matter how weak, oh, it moves him. Oh, he loves it so much. Don't you think that you have to climb some corporate ladder in the kingdom? You just have to turn just a little, just I want to love you. My spirit is willing. My flesh is weak. He knows. That doesn't surprise him. He is not offended by your flesh. He's not offended by your weakness. He knows what he made. And he took on a body. And he knows what emotions are like. And he knows what sadness feels like. And he knows what hunger feels like. And he knows. And he's acquainted with you. And he's not offended. And we keep disqualifying ourselves because we think our humanity somehow disqualifies us from communion with God. When really he's acquainted with us in all of our ways. And it actually fills his heart with compassion and delight. When in our weakness we say, my spirit's well. But my flesh is weak and I want to love you. Will you help me? Will you help me? I'm turning to you today. I'm turning to you right now. Okay, last one. Obedience. Living consecrated. First John 2. Whoever says, I know him but does not keep his commandments as a liar. Ugh. Gosh. Amy texts me. She's like, lead me to repentance today. And I was like, I love you so much. She's just like, go ahead. So there's the word, Amy. Oh, it feels like so convicting. Whoever says I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. But... 
Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Also, obedience is practice. We practice obeying in a million little ways a million times a day in a very real relationship with a very living God that is actively speaking and instructing your heart because he's a good leader. The problem is that we don't let him lead. We don't even ask. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? Is there something that you want me to do? How would you like me to respond? What are you doing in this situation? Do you want me to contribute? Do you want me to stay out of it? Do you want me to say something? Should I delete that Facebook post? We're not even asking. We're just like reacting. But he's a good leader and obedience is how love gets perfected. <laughs> Listen, when my kids obey me the first time I ask them without any resistance, oh my word, how many parents in here? You know, when that happens, you just go, wow, I feel so loved right now. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Listen, that's how love gets perfected. You're like, are you serious? There was no pushback. You just did it. Like I told you and you just did it. And it was like, wow, you heard me. You were actually listening. What in the world? Listen, that's what it looks like. It looks like we lean in. He speaks. We're attentive to the sound of his voice because we are practicing, listening, and beholding. He speaks and we go, what did you say? Okay. Yes, sir, I will do that gladly because I love you and you're a good leader and I trust you, right? And then love gets perfected. All right. Francis Chan said, many spirit-filled authors have exhausted the, th the thesaurus in order to describe God with the glory he deserves. His perfect holiness, by definition, assures us that our words can't contain him. Isn't it a comfort to worship a God we cannot exaggerate? When we see him, we will be compelled to worship him. When we remember how profoundly we've been saved and we rehearse it, we will be compelled to worship him. When we get to know him truly and intentionally, continually, we will be compelled to worship. The privilege of being counted as his counterpart will cause us to worship. When we remember his love, we will be compelled to love in return. Let's stand together. Worship team can come up. I'm already up here. The rest of you that actually play instruments. Okay. I just want to invite you this morning. They're just going to play a little bit. Let's, let's just give the Lord a little bit of time. Okay, can we do that? And let's just sit with him and look at him and ask him if there's anything that he wants to tell us. It's just really practical, but let's practice. Do you guys want to practice? Can we practice for a minute? I know it's almost noon, but let's not be in a hurry. Let's just give him a little time. And if you want to come forward, come forward. If you want to lay on the floor, lay on the floor. But we're just going to sit with him for a minute and look at him and listen to him. Okay? And it's okay if at first you're like, this is awkward. It's okay. We have to start somewhere. But I promise you, when you see him, you'll be compelled to worship him. I promise you that as you know him more, 
you will want to love him more. And I promise you that there is a helper available to you right now in this room to behold God. So God, I thank you that you are the available God. I thank you that you are the ever-present God. Father, I ask that you would give us eyes to see you. That you would give us ears to hear you. That we would step into our place as worshipers.